Hi everybody. We are now in chapter three. Remember we skipped chapter two because we cover that in general biology as well as in anatomy and physiology. And so we kind of let you have a little lax in um, the chemistry portion. Uh, though you will get a lot of chemistry in microbiology, so you know, don't worry if you love the chemistry aspect. Um, th this chapter focuses mainly on um, microorganisms and how we study them. So to study microorganisms, we have to know a little bit about them first. And um, when we look at prokaryotic microbes versus eukaryotic microbes, um, one of the first things we notice is that prokaryotes always are unicellular, whereas eukaryotes can be unicellular or multicellular. But prokaryotic organisms can still live in a community. So they can form multicellular communities and when they do, they're able to communicate with each other um, to allow them to realize or to allow them to um, recognize when they should start replicating or when they need to um, turn on certain uh, metabolic activities or turn off metabolic activities depending on the environment around them. So um, prokaryotic organisms have similar characteristics to eukaryotes. Um, so basic things that pretty much all living things have in common. We all have DNA that is our hereditary material. We all are able to undergo metabolic reactions. So we have um, biochemical reactions that allow us to grow, replicate, produce energy, um, get rid of waste products. We all reproduce, so replication is reproduction. We have to be able to adapt to the environment. Um, one of Darwin's um, statements, one of the things that he said was that um, all living things or no, he didn't say all living things. He said the best adapted to the environment will be able to reproduce and um, pass on their genes. And that is survival of the fittest. We are able to respond to stimuli. So microbes, prokaryotes have to be able to respond to stimuli um, within the environment and, with, and from other organisms so they can communicate with each other. And they have to be able to maintain homeostasis. That's the maintenance of the internal environment, um, even during changing um, conditions. So I told you that prokaryotes are always single-celled, but they can produce multicellular arrangements or communities. One of those communities is called a biofilm. And so a biofilm is formed when uh, microorganisms attach to a surface and start secreting chemicals. That attachment initially is a reversible attachment, so they can attach and they can come unattached. But um, once they start secreting certain chemicals, certain polymers, polysaccharides, then other microbes will attach and then it is considered an irreversible attachment. I have something on my arm, I just noticed. Um, so from there, you're going to have um, replication of cells. You're going to have new cells come in. Um, these cells don't have to be the same type of cells. So it, just because you started off with, say, E. coli, you don't have to just have E. coli there. You can have um, Streptococcus, Staphylococcus, um, Clostridial species, whatever, will join. And eventually, you can even have other types of organisms like protozoans or... Um, other eukaryotic organisms joining in. And the idea behind a biofilm 
is organisms living are living together and they can um, benefit from each other. So the organisms at the surface of the biofilm are going to be able to get nutrients from the environment, like say oxygen or other nutrients, and their waste products, their metabolic waste, may be what organisms deeper in the biofilm need to metabolize and produce energy for themselves. And so they're gaining nutrients from each other and they're protecting each other. So any type of antibiotic that tries to come in to get rid of the, bi of the um, biofilm is not going to be effective. It may get rid of a few of the cells in the biofilm, but it will not get rid of the biofilm. So one biofilm that everybody has to deal with is plaque. Plaque is a biofilm that forms on teeth and plaque forms immediately after you start brushing or after you finish brushing. So we brush our teeth every night before bed and we brush our teeth every morning before going to work or whatever, right? As soon as we stop brushing our teeth, bacteria start aggregating on our teeth again. This is common, all right? Um, I'm swallowing, sorry. <sighs> sorry about that. So the only way to get rid of a biofilm then is to mechanically remove it. So brushing our teeth twice daily helps to remove the plaque so that we don't have a large plaque buildup. Going to the dentist every six months to get rid of any potential um, plaque that has built up and um, we didn't get rid of. They might get some tartar buildup gone, plaque buildup, anything that's under the gums that we didn't get at. They're able to get rid of that. And that protects us from gum disease, gingivitis, as well as periodontal disease. So when bacteria are in a multicellular community like a biofilm, they're able to interact with each other and they talk to each other. And the form of talking is through chemical release. So this is called quorum sensing. They release chemicals in the environment that allows cells in that environment to know if um, the environment is conducive for replication or if they should turn off certain metabolic activities. And then, so here you're seeing a low cell density. And so the signaling molecules are coming out and they're basically um, showing that the bacteria have a very wide space between each other so they can replicate. And so the bacteria start replicating, more signaling molecules are produced um, telling that the bacteria are much more um, closely aggregated and so they're going to turn off maybe replication and turn on some other mechanism. So um, prokaryotes and eukaryotes also are similar in our organization. So eukaryotic organisms have a nucleus which can which contains our DNA as well as our RNA and um, bacteria also have a region that contains their DNA so that region oh sorry that region is known as a nucleoid region right here um, bacteria and eukaryotes use compartments within their cell to um, allow for certain metabolic reactions. So in bacteria, we have compartments that might hold, house nutrients or waste or gases. In eukaryotes, we have compartments for um, energy production or for um, packaging proteins. Those are called organelles. And in both bacteria and eukaryotes, we have ribosomes for protein synthesis. This is a cute song, I believe. And I think I can play it for you. So I'm going to... Oh. 
We'll see if it pops up. Oh, look at this. Pa-Ching. So this is just a cute song. Um, I've been talking for 10 minutes, so it'll make you happy, I think. So enjoy it. I am a prokaryote, a simple little cell. Too good much inside me, yet it does me very well. Brain bright as stumps and scattered DNA. Just the necessities, but I do okay. Sometimes I have no I'm quite simple. My DNA is in a section called the nucleoid. My body parts all float around in a liquid called the cytoplasm. But besides that, I'm quite simple. Really? Oh wait, did I say that already? Ah, let me check my script. Oh, oh yes, yes, it's that important. Just remember that I'm really simple. But despite this, I'm capable of withstanding extreme to me as compared to my cousin, the Eukaryo. Speaking of whom, here he comes. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I love that song. Um, I love most goofy things, though, if you didn't know that already. I just enjoy um, fun. So, so um, we do have structural distinctions between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. Eukaryotes do have their membrane-bound organelles. Um, I don't know if you remember every membrane-bound organelle. But I do have a, I believe, I do not have it linked up here. I thought I did. Um, if you struggle with membrane-bound organelles, um, there is a list of them. And so you can kind of see a lot of the structures here. But I will actually go over them with, or I will actually um, provide a link for you to go to a, just a quick like five minute video that talks about the different organelles that are found in eukaryotic organisms. The only reason I don't tend to go over them, but I do tend to expect you to know them is because most people have taken general biology and so you've learned all the organelles there. So that's why. Both eukaryotic organisms and prokaryotic organisms can um, photosynthesize. So photosynthesis is a process of producing energy from sunlight energy. So you produce chemical energy in the form of food from sunlight energy, which is the ultimate energy force for the entire earth. Um, eukaryotic organisms and prokaryotic organisms have a form of a cytoskeleton. Eukaryotic cytoskeleton um, provides structure and uh, movement of materials, whereas, or and, not whereas, and the prokaryotic cytoskeletal filaments provide the same structure and transport of materials. Both eukaryotic organisms and prokaryotes can have flagella. Um, they are used for motility, so typically this, they move the cells from one place to another place. Um, humans only have one flagellated cell, and that is sperm, whereas protozo pro 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 protozoans are eukaryotic organisms that can be flagellated, um, and they can have multiple flagella. Bacteria can also be flagellated and have multiple flagella. Um, prokaryotes and pretty, um, I pretty much say all prokaryotes, but not quite all prokaryotes have a cell wall. 
Um, so almost all prokaryotic organisms and many eukaryotic organisms have a cell wall. Cell wall provides um, structure, but it also helps to maintain water balance inside of the cells. I'm going to stop this right here. I have a video I want to show you, so hold on one second. All right, um, I'm going to end this video in just a moment, but I wanted to talk to you quickly about um, the endosymbiotic theory. So we always try to figure out where living things came from. You know, was it the Big Bang? Was it this? Was it that? So the idea um, of where living things came from what actually stimulated the um, development of the first organism is something that we don't have a perfect grasp on yet, but we do have a really good grasp on how eukaryotic organisms came to be. And so I have a video that talks about this. I just wanted to mention a couple of things first. This endosymbiotic theory was developed by Lynn Margulis in the 1980s. And um, basically what she states is that eukaryotes or large bacterial cells took in smaller bacterial cells and instead of breaking them down for food or nutrients, they used the cells, so they each used each other, for some benefit, so they formed a symbiotic, a mutualistic symbiotic relationship, and both cells survived. Um, and so this is what I'm going to show you. It's a TED-Ed talk. I've, I'm sure you've heard of those. So it's only a five-minute video, and I love it. If I can get this turned off, I will do it. Okay, let's just do that. There we go. Look at that. How easy that was, right? All right, and here we go. What, what if you could absorb another organism and take on its abilities? Imagine you swallowed a small bird and suddenly gained the ability to fly. Or if you engulfed a cobra and were then able to spit poisonous venom from your teeth. Throughout the history of life, Specifically during the evolution of complex eukaryotic cells, things like this happened all the time. One organism absorbed another, and they united to become a new organism with the combined abilities of both. We think that around 2 billion years ago, the only living organisms on Earth were prokaryotes, single-celled organisms lacking membrane-bound organelles. Let's look closely at just three of them. One was a big, simple, blob-like cell with the ability to absorb things by wrapping its cell membrane around them. Another was a bacterial cell that converted solar energy into sugar molecules through photosynthesis. A third used oxygen gas to break down materials like sugar and release its energy into a form useful for life activities. The blob cells would occasionally absorb the little photosynthetic bacteria. These bacteria then lived inside the blob and divided like they always had, but their existence became linked. If you stumbled upon this living arrangement, you might just think that the whole thing was one organism, that the green photosynthetic bacteria were just a part of the blob that performed one of its life functions just like your heart is a part of you that performs the function of pumping your blood. This process of cells living together is called endosymbiosis. One organism living inside another. But the endosymbiosis didn't stop there. What would happen if the other bacteria moved in too? Now the cells of this species started becoming highly complex. They were big and full of intricate structures that we call chloroplasts, and mitochondria. These structures worked together to harness sunlight, make sugar, and break down that sugar using the oxygen that right around this time started to appear in the Earth's atmosphere. 
Organisms absorbing other organisms was one way species adapted to the changing environmental conditions of their surroundings. This little story highlights what biologists call the endosymbiotic theory, the current best explanation of how complex cells evolved. There's a lot of evidence that supports this theory, but let's look at three main pieces. First, the chloroplasts and mitochondria in our cells multiply the very same way as those ancient bacteria, which are still around, by the way. In fact, if you destroy these structures in a cell, no new ones will appear. The cell can't make them. They can only make more of themselves. Second piece of evidence. Chloroplasts and mitochondria both contain their own DNA and ribosomes. Their DNA has a circular structure that is strikingly similar to the DNA of the ancient bacteria, and it also contains many similar genes. The ribosomes, or protein assembly machines of chloroplasts and mitochondria, also have the same structure as ribosomes of ancient bacteria, but are different from the ribosomes hanging around the rest of the eukaryotic cell. Lastly, Think about the membranes involved in the engulfing process. Chloroplasts and mitochondria both have two membranes surrounding them, an inner and outer membrane. Their inner membrane contains some particular lipids and proteins that are not present in the outer membrane. Why is that significant? Because their outer membrane used to belong to the blob cell. When they were engulfed in the endosymbiosis process, they got wrapped up in that membrane and kept their own as their inner one. Sure enough, those, those same lipids, lipids and proteins, proteins are found on the membranes of the ancient bacteria. Biologists now use this theory to explain the origin of the vast variety of eukaryotic organisms. Take the green algae that grow on the walls of swimming pools. A larger eukaryotic cell with spinning tail structures, or flagella, at some point absorbed algae like these to form what we now call euglena. Euglena can perform photosynthesis, break down sugar using oxygen, and swim around pond water. And as the theory would predict, the chloroplasts in these euglena have three membranes, since they had two before being engulfed. <laughs> the absorbing process of endosymbiotic theory allowed organisms to combine powerful abilities to become better adapted to life on Earth. The results were species capable of much more than when they were separate organisms. And this was an evolutionary leap that led to the microorganisms, plants, and animals we observe on the planet today. Okay. All right, I'm going to shut this video down. Um, and I will start the next video on this or on the next slide, okay? So you guys have a wonderful evening or morning, depending on when you are, where you are right now, and take a mini break, and then I'll see you in a few minutes.